Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in. What you are about to listen to and watch is uh, a reflection that I made on the subject of the Filioque Doctrine that took place in a larger discussion in our global catechism Zoom. I hope you enjoy it and that it will be edifying for your soul. God be with you. It says, Father Josiah, would you please elaborate on the heresy of the Filioque and how it diminishes the providence and power of the Holy Spirit? It's a very important question. I'm looking for our questionnaire. Rachel, is, are, you, are you? I think I see you, Rachel. That's you. So the Filioque, uh, it's called that, that Western heresy is called Filioque from the Latin filio, son, and que, and. Uh, that those words together were added to the creed definitively uh, in the early 11th century uh, by the Pope at the time. This happened in 1009. It had first shown itself uh, creedally uh, in the 5th century in what is now Spain uh, as an attempt by the Spanish bishops to pu push back against a uh, re-emergence of the Arian heresy, which taught that Jesus is the highest of all creatures, but not the co-eternal Son of God, a total, terrible blasphemy against the deity of Christ. Of course, the Arians were put down at the First Ecumenical Council, and then again definitively in the Second Council. Uh, but there was, because of the incursion of the barbarians after the fall of Rome into what is now Western, what we call Western Europe, uh, many of these barbarians separated themselves from the, the, the Christianity of the empire by embracing a form of Arianism. And some of the, uh, the Spanish or Iberian bishops there were trying to uh, push back against that heresy. They thought that by taking St. Augustine's uh, thoughts about the, in his work on the Holy Trinity, in which he made an affirmation uh, that of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, Though obviously it wasn't in his creed and he knew it wasn't creedal. It was his kind of contemplation. He had a lot of contemplations. Remember, he was a, a complex philosopher, loved universally by the fathers, uh, but not for his experimental theology. Uh, most of uh, the great fathers loved St. Augustine, especially because of his piety, especially because of his confessions, his most famous of all books, um, and his government of the church. But uh, that that dogma that was uh, contemplated by Augustine was picked up by these bishops. They were heavily criticized by the Pope. Two centuries later, the Franks did the same thing, uh, promoting the filioque, and again were, around 800, were chastised by not just the Eastern patriarchs, but by the Pope, and he had the original creed of Nicaea in Greek and its original Latin translation affixed to the doors of the Vatican, to St. Peter's. As a matter of fact, those plates still exist. Uh, they're not on the doors of St. Peter anymore, but if you walk through the doors into St. Peter Church in Rome, they're in the narthex, on the south side of the narthex. You can still see the original. When uh, the popes changed their mind uh, about uh, the filioque in the 11th century, and they actually inserted into the creed, there was a cessation of commemoration of the pope uh, by the Eastern patriarchs, uh, because that not only was he affirming a heresy, the filioque heresy, which was articulated as such in great detail by St. Photius the Great in the ninth century in his Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, and then picked up later by uh, other fathers like St. Gregory Palamas in great detail. This is 14th century. St. Mark of Ephesus in the 15th century. We have a lot of material on the error of the, fil of the filioque. But that, uh, that heresy has been uh, embraced and held since the 11th century in the West. Not only is it a heresy, and I'll explain what's so dastardly about it in a second, but it's also um, inserting it into the creed was an act of immense pride on the part of the Pope, as though the Pope had authority over the ecumenical creeds of the church. Uh, up until the, Pope, the, the reign of a very uh, arrogant Pope named Nicholas I, uh, in the middle of the ninth century. This was the opponent of St. Photius the Great. Uh, up until that time of Nicholas, uh, the canon law collection in the East, as well as in the West, began with the apostolic canons, the 85 apostolic canons, was followed by the canons of the ecumenical councils, then by the local councils, then by the Holy Fathers. 
and by and particular patriarchs in the west that's where you would find papal decrees at the end of that canonical collection after the ninth century after pope nicholas the first and remember this is also the time of the hideous catholic lies known as the isidorian decretals and the donation of constantine these were forged documents to support this concept of the pope as being the universal head of the church uh, of being uh, possessing spiritual as well as temporal power complete forgeries but pope nicholas promoted them like they were authentic uh, decrees given by the great equal of the apostles and god crowned king constantine supposedly these these documents had uh were preserved the preservation of documents from constantine's reign in which he gave his tiara his crown to the pope and declared that he had universal authority even in the, over the temporal realm complete garbage completely made up but used for six and a half centuries by a succession of popes who wanted power to 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 redefine the government of the church and so after this period after nicholas's use of these 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 documents uh, they redesigned the western canonical collection and instead of being apostolic canons ecumenical councils local councils etc well guess what's at the top papal decrees <laughs> as though they are the most important and most authoritative uh, collection what's so terrible about the filioque heresy what's so terrible about the filioque heresy is that uh, it attacks the unique persons of the father son and holy spirit in this way the theological principle of the church is that whatever is not shared by common essence that which makes god god is unique to the person so what uh the father the son and the holy spirit all share a common nature a divine nature things constituted like uh, a by omnipotence omnipotence the fact that god is all-powerful omniscience the fact that god is all-knowing uh wisdom etc uncircumscribability all of those things are simply qualities that make god god and they're shared equally by the father by his co-eternal son and by the holy spirit whatever is unique to the father son and holy spirit that is not part of that common essence belongs only to the person so the father for instance is the origin or the monarch of the trinity the, the his son is begotten of him outside of time and the holy spirit spirates or is generate or is uh, proceeding from him the son is the son and this is the unique qualities of the person of the son what sets him apart from his father is that he's not the father he's not the origin he's the only begotten he's the beloved son who has always rested in the father's bosom he is the father's word and the holy spirit proceeds from the father so what's unique about the holy spirit is not that he's all powerful or all knowing those are qualities of divinity that he shares with the father and the son what's unique about the holy spirit is that he is the spirit who proceeds from the father and he rests upon the son as soon as you take one of the qualities which is uh, the quality of the holy spirit uh to be proceeding from the father and you apply it to another person so you say now that the holy spirit proceeds from the father and the son you have immediately attacked that principle that theological principle of how to know god which is that what's common to the deity uh, is common to all three persons and whatever else is unique to the particular person that is no more because now the father and the son share something that is not a quality of divinity it's a quality of the person that the holy spirit does not share the father is no longer just the monarch and the son just the only begotten but they together are the source from which the holy spirit pr processes so now the father and the son have something together that is not divinity or else the holy spirit would have it too and is not unique to their person because they're sharing something that the holy spirit does not share there is some aspect of the divine relationship unique to the person that the holy spirit has nothing to do with and th it's this demotion of the holy spirit and this violation of the of the theological principles of the church that whatever does not belong to the common nature is unique to the person that we find so offensive in the affirmation of the filioque and we think that's why the catholics have the, the the latins in general have once they've demoted the holy spirit in the relationship of the persons of the trinity make excluding him from some sort of relationship that the father and the son share that he doesn't share as a result the very glue of the church which is the holy spirit he who 
binds the church together in its uh, theanthropic life has been demoted and therefore they've tried to hold themselves together by the creation of an external worldly apparatus which hasn't worked they've created all of these things since the uh, embrace of the filioque heresy the college of cardinals and um the all, inventing papal infallibility and all of these ideas about how powerful the pope is in order supposedly to hold the church together and govern her but what do we see uh great theological chaos that makes the the small disagreements that orthodox hierarchs have between each other look like child's play compared to what's going on in the catholic world uh theologically speaking so we think it has tremendous uh, results negative results Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a new six-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled Demonology, Understanding and Winning the Spiritual Battle. The study of the Church's demonology is a part of basic catechism and Christian instruction. The scriptures are replete with teaching on the dark powers. Additionally, it is impossible to appreciate the magnitude of the saving deeds of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, without understanding how he, and he alone, has conquered Satan and destroyed his works. Lastly, Christians are called to fight and win in the spiritual war, and for this reason it is essential that believers understand their enemies and their tactics. Toward this end, Father Josiah presents in these lectures in-depth studies of the scriptures, divine services, and pedagogy of great saints and teachers on the subject of Satan and spiritual battle. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.